Howdy. Howdy. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today uh, from Purdue University. He received his PhD degree from the Academy, uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences. He then continues his uh, research efforts in the University of Chicago for nine years and then moved to uh, Purdue University after that. Um, along the way, he received numerous honors and awards and uh, published over 60 original articles, uh, several book chapters and reviews. He, also, he has also been invited to numerous conferences, both internationally and nationally. Um, in addition, he's also active in numerous professional organizations, including American Society of Human Genetics, American Association for Sexual Disease, etc. Currently, our speaker is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicinal Chemistry and Molecular uh, pharmacology for the university, as well as an adjunct assistant professor in Indiana University School of Medicine. His current interests are in human disease genomics, pharmacogenomics, personalized medicine, and identifying uh, genetic variants and molecular targets of disease pathogenesis, as well as therapeutics. Uh, examples of interested diseases are lung, and liver diseases such as bed liver, lung cancer, etc. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Wan Ching Liu. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. And this is a great opportunity. I have to uh, thank Dr. Chapkin um, to invite me to give a talk right here to show our data. Uh, hopefully, we could, you know, um, have you know, better discussion. Uh, Later on, and I would like to learn more stuff from you as well. So today, I'm going to uh, give the, uh, um, some of our recent study focusing on fatty acid desaturates uh, and, and how these um, enzymes actually in interact with um, the fish oil as, as one of the important dietary uh, components. And involving the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Okay, so so what is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? You know, but by the name, it's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So, which is different from the al alcoholic? Because you know, if you take a lot of al alcohol, it will lead to um, some of the fat accumulation in the liver as well. Uh, but without that, you know, that we call it you know, non-alcoholic fatty liver. So the, the criteria for making this cutoff is 30 gram um, alcohol intake every day for men and, and 20 gram um, for w uh, women. Um, so you could roughly about two bottles of beer or you know, a third of uh, wine, a third um, you know, glass of wine, so which is not a lot you know, in your mind. Um, so, um, but this is a daily, okay, this is like a daily uh, okay. okay. Um, if you just drink once, you know, per weekend, I mean, that's, that would be fine. I mean, that's not uh, cause a lot of problem, okay? But um, non-alcoholic fatty liver is um, endemic right now. Uh, it's over, in general, 30% of our population has um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In general, um, everybody gonna have more or less, you know, fat accumulation in the liver, though. Okay, it would not kill people. Um, usually, we regard this as benign. Okay, uh, but over time, um, you know, if you don't treat them, you know, some of them will be developed into uh, what we call uh, still uh, state two uh, hepatitis, which is an inflammatory uh, uh, state uh, status. So this is about talk about fifteen to twenty percent of the patient. Uh, with steatosis, uh, which is you know uh, a lot of fat accumulation in the liver. Okay, so over time that could trigger inflammation. Not all the people, but this is a higher risk factor. Okay. Um, of course, you know once you have inflammation, you know some of like a, th um, a fourth of people, like a twenty-five percent. Um, you know if there is no treatment over time, again, I mean that that would you know um, trigger the fibrogenesis. Um, you know. Uh, Part and that will lead to cirrhosis, and, and and then we know that the cirrhosis is a high risk factor, you know, for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay. So you can see this is, you know, uh, a very clear um, 
disease progression model uh, in the liver. Uh, and currently, uh, this spectrum is the uh, most um, common chronic liver disease uh, in the world, actually. So, uh, so what is the uh, outcome of the uh, non-alcoholic fat liver? Okay, so from the liver itself, it's, it has a you know, pretty heavy burden. Um, so again, I mean, as I said, this is the most common cause of the elevated liver enzyme, you know, making the liver function lower, okay? Uh, NASH, which is the inflammation uh, status, is a progressive, you know, with 20% risk of cirrhosis over 10 years, okay? Uh, this is uh, the highest risk uh, factor, you know, for cirrhosis without alcohol intake. And also without, you know, the uh, liver hepatitis virus like uh, HCV, okay. But like um, the estimation, uh, simply because you know there are many um, new drugs developed, you know, for uh, HCV right now. You know, I just came back from the liver meeting yesterday. Uh, you know, seems like the HCV is more likely to be controlled, you know, in the future. So you could imagine that you know, the HCV burden actually you know, getting lower in, in our population, but in you know, the non-alcoholic fat liver uh, disease is getting higher. Okay, so it was at estimated in five years, so probably by you know, 2020, um, non-alcoholic fat liver disease is going to be number one reason for liver transplantation. I mean, this is you know, pretty huge. Okay, um, of course, um, this is also at you know, moderate. Um, effect about the liver cancer. You know, this is um, once you reach to the cirrhosis stage and the liver cancer stage. You know, there's not a lot of you know option that we could take. Okay. Um, so, but beyond the liver itself, it also have burning. You know, for other um, outcomes as well. Mortality. I mean, if you see that. Um, there are many, many studies showing that uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver patient, you know, has higher mortality, you know, than um, the normal control. Uh, the incident of uh, cardiovascular disease, you know, this is also highly correlated. You know, uh, there are many, many studies showing that, you know, there are pretty high risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Uh, and also the incident of uh, type 2 diabetes, okay, uh, you see this is um, even stronger and there are many, many Studies showing that you know higher fat accumulation, the higher risk of uh, type two diabetes. You know, there's highly correlated with obesity as well. You know, which is not a very um, surprise. So you see, um, there are many uh, comorbidities about um, you know co-happen you know to uh, fatty liver disease. You know, this including type two diabetes. Diabetes, epidemia, obesity, and other metabolic um, syndrome like you know cardiovascular disease, and there are some uh, emerging um, associations recently identified like um, sleep apnea um, uh, and and those things as well. You know there are many many um, symptoms that 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 highly correlated with um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. You see, you see this is a pretty um, stunning and. and High impact to, to to the health of um, human beings. Um, so, if you look at the epidemiology from the whole population, actually, you could see some um, differences, you know, from population to population. So, one thing that people observe is less common. You know, NFLD is less common among African American. Okay, um, that um, if but if you look at you know those black people, they have comparable obesity. Um, diabetes, those, etc. Okay, meaning that they are kind of like more protected, you know, about their liver. Uh, this is, ex you know, in contrast with Hispanic, you know, which you could see about, you know, forty um, percent above. You know, they have, you know, this is the highest uh, incident rate, you know, in among populations. You know, Hispanic has had more um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, of Again, I mean, white and Asian, they are in between about, you know, in general about 30%, okay? Um, so, what caused the, this disease, okay? Of course, you see there are many, many reasons, okay? Diet, okay, what, what we call, we blame for the Western diet, okay? Why Western diet, you know, I'm gonna show you more. Diabetes, of course, you know, you have a diabetes, you know, the glucose level is going to be higher in your body, uh, which will making some, you know, differences about, you know, the imbalance in the liver. 
okay? Obesity, you know, definitely it's a comorbidity of that, okay? Lifestyle, um, you know, you have some fat accumulated anywhere. I mean, you, if you're more active, you know, that, that going to reduce. You know, um, but if you're more, um, you know, coach potato, you know, you're going you're gonna to have a lot of accumulation, you know, that's no doubt. Um, but also, you know, genetic factors get involved, you know, as well. Um, actually, if you look at the human disease, you know, more or less, we always, you know, keep in mind, you know, this is, you know, a, a, a both a ge genetic factor and an environmental factor involved. Okay, so for almost any disease, you know, this is, you know, the model that genetic, you know, uh, interact with environmental. Okay, so. Look at this picture. You know that I get this next picture. You know from from a website that showing up that in the human history how the diet um, uh, was changed. You know in our population. You know, you see. You know this is this is the fat. Okay, the total fat. You know you see uh, for many many years. You know before the modern um, you know um, uh, society. You know um, the total fat is actually you know quite low. Okay. But once we step into the modern um, society, you know, the intake of total fat get you know much higher. Uh, we know the polyunsaturated fat, okay, meaning the carbon chain. You know, we have a lot of a double bond right there. You know, the, what we call PUFA, okay, uh, versus the saturated, saturated like a lard, okay, um, uh, Bergs. You know, you are gonna have a lot of saturated fat. So those um, PUFA, you know, the polyunsaturated fatty acid, you know, getting lower. Okay, you see that's the change as well. And what we heard about omega six and omega three lipids, you know, uh, we know omega three is good thing. You know, fish oil, EPA, DHA, we heard about, you know, always. You know. Um, uh, and you see the ratio um, from about a one to one in a very early um, stage, you know, to now about a twenty, even thirty to one. Okay, so that means much higher omega-6 um, polyunsaturated fat you know, versus um, the omega-3. Okay, so this is a huge change, you know, about that. So that's no matter that you you can imagine this might be contributing to the lot of disease, okay, including um, alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, so those are the, the the fatty acid. You know, this is um, saturated fatty acid. Okay, um, uh, I, I guess a lot of people are nutrition and biochemical uh, area. You already know, you know those um, uh, molecules. You know, that, uh, actually, I'm new. You know, I, I'm learning this right now. You know, I, I'm a geneticist. You know, but we just recently got into this area. I'm trying the best to understand what the fat acid is. Okay, um, you see, basically, uh, you know, the name of the uh, fat acid is is really involved in you know, a long uh, carbon chain. Okay, um, so if you give a name of that, you know, this is number of a carbon, uh, and this is number of a double bond between the carbon, okay? Um, so palmitic acid, this is the most common um, saturated fat, uh, fatty acid in, in human and also animal. MUFA, what do we call monounsaturated fat acid, this is, you know, adding one double bond, you know, between um, uh, two carbon. Uh, uh, you see the oleic acid, this is 18 are carbons, uh, but one double bond. I mean, this is the most common MUFA, okay, in animal uh, and also in human. Um, talk about PUFA, you know, polyunsaturated fatty acid. You know, this is usually a little bit longer uh, chain. You see this is 18. Uh, this is a uh, linoleic acid, you know, which has two double bonds. Um, and, and this is omega-6. Why is it called omega-6? Is a counting from here, you know, one, two, three, four, five. So it's, it, it double bond start from the number three position. This is omega three. Okay, if we're starting from a, a number six, this is you know um, the uh, omega six. If, it, if this is right, uh, Rob, you know, I, 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 I just want to you know deliver some right thing, you know, not wrong thing. Okay. Um, so we know the essential fatty acid. Okay, essential fatty acid is what do we talk about? The two main precursors, okay? And those two things, one is LA, linoleic acid, alpha linolenic acid, ALA, I mean, those are mainly, um, you know, uh, like omega-3, uh, omega-6 precursor that we could find from, especially plant 
base uh, diet. Okay, and those two things cannot be biosynthesized by our body. Okay, we know there are a lot of um, you know fish like salmon. You know, they have a lot lot of fish oil. Mainly they have a lot of EPA and DHA, and they they actually accumulate those EPA and DHA. They they, they don't they don't make this as well. I mean they cannot like make this in their body. They, they accumulate a lot of EPA and DHA in their body because they are like in the upper level of the, the food chain and they keep eating a lot of you know grass, you know, other um, little fish and, and they accumulate those fat in their body. That's why you know, they eat fish. Um, and those are essential fatty acids and, and uh, after some metabolism, uh, mainly um, several enzymes, one is called uh, delta-6 desaturase, okay? One is delta-5 desaturase. So those two enzymes was encoded by fat acid 2, fat acid desaturase number 2, fat acid desaturase number 1. And there are several elongases um, in between is involved as well. Those elongases basically make a tension of the carbon chain. You see from here, this is 18 carbon, and uh, to here 20, uh, and 22, and even 24. And there's elongases, you keep adding the carbon you know, to there. Well, the fatty acid desaturase is basically adding double bond you know, between um, the, uh, the carbon chain, okay? So I would like to point it out there three um, PUFA is very uh, bioactive, okay? Um, Arachidonic acid, you know, this is one of the major N6, okay, omega-6 um, uh, PUFA, okay, this is a bioactive. Uh, EPA and DHA, and those two are omega-3 um, PUFA, okay, those are three major uh, bioactive. Why we see this is bioactive? Because they are precursors um, of one thing, you know, they are involving the biomembrane. Okay, those are PUFA, long fat chain, I mean, they integrate into biomembrane, cell membrane, mitochondria, you know, whatever. Um, of it. Um, but also, they are, those are molecules like a precursor can make a lot of other things, okay, by several other enzymes making into um, prostaglandins, uh, um, thromboxins, leukotrienes, okay, um, and also resorbings and protectings, okay, um, under several enzymes. Uh, but the main thing I would like to deliver to you is that arachidonic acid basically they make like the bad things, okay, the, those leukotrienes and, and thromboboxins and, and, and prostaglandins basically are they are pro-inflammatory and this is a major function of that, okay. While the EPA and DHA produce those things are anti-inflammatory. Okay? We know inflammation is not good for many diseases. You know, keep this in mind. And so you can see this two set of proof are actually making a balance in your body. So if we're kind of an imbalance, then you can imagine a lot of things going to happen. Um, so again, I mean, as I said, you know, this is either inflammatory and this is all. Um, um, anti-inflammatory, especially EPA and DHA, has such uh, effect for anti-inflammation, but also is involved, you know, as a uh, ligand, you know, for for some uh, transcript factors. You know, one of them is called PPAR alpha peroxism uh, proliferator uh, activity receptor alpha, uh, which is a key regulator for lipid metabolism. Okay, uh, we see that the lipid going to be burned. You know. Uh, in the mitochondria, uh, and, and this guy can basically um, all just for, you know, the, the expression of those uh, enzymes involved in the lipid burning, okay, what we call beta ex oxidation. Another transcript factor is SREDP, uh, stable uh, regulatory elementary binding protein. I mean, this guy is um, regulating a lot of, you know, the enzyme and, and key genes involving lipid, lipogenesis, okay? So EP and DHC basically can increase this, so increase the burning uh, of the lipid, okay? And also decrease this guy, so decrease the lipogenesis, the novo genesis of the, the lipid, okay? Then you can imagine in Western diet, we have too much omega-6 versus omega-3, and then this is a huge imbalance. So that we see a lot of pro-inflammation. We know we already remember that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease involve a lot of inflammation, especially getting into the NASH stage, right? And also the lipid homeostasis was changed. You know that's that's one of the reasons. 
so, but recent study showing that this may not be exactly uh, the whole story. Okay, let me show you why. Um, so, there's this is you know the some theory about you know epidemiology study showing that the deficiency you know in general okay the in, endogenous level okay, from your blood for example or your tissue sample okay you have a lower omega three PUFA uh, and that will lead to a lot of disease okay mainly disorders in cognitive function okay it's you know you have you have a lower um, uh, I think there was a several studies showing that if you have lower omega three level uh, in breast milk, for example, and then the IQ of the key is going to be lower as well. Okay, this is a cognitive function. Uh, cardiovascular, you know, of course, because um, it's um, involving the lipid metabolism, uh, involving triglyceride metabolism, and then you can imagine that us lipidemia is going to be involved as well. Okay. Uh, muscular and the bone, and also some immune uh, system, especially allergic disease, uh, asthma, eczema, you know, that's uh, highly correlated with uh, omega-3 deficiency. Um, but the, the deficiency of the, um, the uh, omega-3 proof, though, uh, okay, of course, one thing we blame about Western diet, the other thing that recent study just showing up that, you know, one of the enzymes might be involved you know, as a genetic uh, effect, okay? And this is a focus on the fatty acid-1 gene, okay? So let's see the story. So there are many, many, uh, we know about the GWAS. You guys know what is the GWAS? Genome-wide association study, okay? Those are like basically genotyping, you know, whatever your genome-wide polymorphism to see which one gonna be linked with a particular um, phenotype, okay? A GWAS actually, many, many GWAS were done in many, many patients of uh, different disease, you know, identify, keep identifying a lot of polymorphisms within this um, locus, okay? In the locus, there's FATS1, FATS2, and also FATS3. I think FATS3 is right here. FATS2, this guy, and FATS1 is right here. So there are po many polymorphisms, as many as 42, they're linked together, okay? And those are non coding. Polymorphism is what we call single nucleotide polymorphism or SNP, okay? And uh, across the whole locus, okay, on chromosome 11, okay? And those um, SNPs are keep identifying um, in many GWAS, uh, linked with a lot of um, um, disease stickers. I, I would like to show you this first, okay? Um, so this is including uh, that you know, the uh, the blood level and the phospholipid, like a PUFA, okay? Um, mainly lower PUFA, lower omega-3 PUFA, okay? Those SNP, there's, you know, uh, two alleles, you know, one allele, what we call minor allele, the other one is more common, what we call major allele. So the minor allele basically lead to a lower um, omega-3, especially EPA and DHA level in, your, in human body. Uh, it's also correlated with um, higher triglyceride in the blood and higher um, LDL. Uh, we know those are two um, bad things. Uh, with lower, though, you know, high um, um, HDL, uh, HDL, basically, that's a good cholesterol, right? And this is also linked with uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, and it's weak, but also consistent, um, you know, linked with diabetes. You know, there's, you know, if you have a minor allele carrier, you have more chance to have the um, diabetes or higher glucose level. Uh, and this is, again, um, linked to the cognitive development, uh, allergic um, development, also infl inflammation markers like the secreting uh, proteins in human body, okay? Well, if you look at, you know, the distribution of those um, um, minor allele and, and the major allele, okay, uh, simply because those are 42 SNPs and they link it together and form to what we call haplotype, the combination of those major alleles uh, from one haplotype, what we call haplotype D, and the other with, you know, minor allele from, you know, the haplotype A, okay. Uh, so if you look at the distribution in Africa, Europe, and Asia, and, and there are some, you know, uh, Oceania, America, basically, 
those minor alleles are quite low in African um, people, okay? Uh, but in the middle, about 30% within the Caucasian and Asian, and much higher in Hispanic um, or Ocean American. Okay, this is corresponding to the epidemiological prevalence about NFLD, okay, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We know that the uh, um, African people has uh, some protective effect, while the Hispanic has, you know, much higher risk of that. Okay, uh, so. And uh, people already studied a lot about the PUFA, especially omega-3 PUFA, and the relationship between that and, and FLD, okay? Um, many studies in the animal model showing that dietary depletion of omega-3 PUFA basically lead to um, accumulation of fat, okay? This is using oil red oil staining of the, those with uh within the liver. Uh, but if you supplement the fish oil, um, EPA and DHA, to the mouse diet basically became uh, lower, uh, uh, reverse this, okay? In human though, a lot of um, studies that show the lower intake of omega-3, like the lower uh, supplementation or lower fish intake, okay, that's associated with um, FOD, okay? You see the, the level of omega-3 uh, in the um, obesity uh, people with uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is much lower than the healthy control. Okay, um, and if you just look at the NFLD patient and the lower, they have an endogenous level of uh, omega-3 PUFA in both their um, red blood cell membrane. I mean, that's one of the index that we look, you know, the intake of the uh, EPA and DHA, and also in their liver biopsy. You, know, you see this is consistent, uh, pretty consistent, okay? In our study, we published this in 2012. We see in the liver tissue, though, okay, if you measure the uh, total fat, you know, whatever the triglyceride level, um, this is mainly the, the, the fat content, okay, in the liver. If you measure that, and also the expression level of fat S1, we see an, um, a negative correlation, okay. So the higher the fat S1, the lower um, the total fat, okay. And then the reverse way is going to be the lower fat S1 and the higher total fat accumulation. There's also a um, GWAS study showing that the, the, allele, the minor allele lead to a lower uh, activity um, that has a high correlation with um, lipid function enzyme level, okay? Increase the, um, uh, the alkaline phosphatase um, level uh, from uh, the human, okay? So those evidence basically form the, our hypothesis that reduce the function of the fatty acid desaturase one that may lead to higher risk about um, fatty liver disease. If that is the case, then we supplement the EPA DHA or fish oil to the patient, um, the, you might be expect to see a better response from there, okay? So our approach using, you know, correlative study in human liver tissue, and we also did some mechanistic study on um, cell line basis study, also co collaboration with Dr. Fan and Dr. Uh, Chapkin in their lab using a mouse model. Okay, I'll show you some data that we collected. So first of all, we collected a lot of human liver tissue from uh, donors. Okay, those are like transplantation donors. They, you know, whatever they're gonna trash those um, leftovers. But we just collected, you know, um, for our study. And we collected 150 um, those human liver tissue. And uh, we did in you know, the whole genome, uh, SNP genotype, and this will talk about 600,000 um, um, in total SNP being genotyped on a microarray and transcriptome. And uh, lipidome, you know, we using mass spec, you know, to quantify the phospholipid, you know, many, many phospholipid within those liver tissue as well. And we quantify the total um, fat content, you know, in these uh, livers um, as well. So this is a one of the study, what we call the EQTL mapping, okay, gene expression. So E means expression, quantitative, quantitative treat loci, okay, those are, um, so imagine, I mean, all the people uh, within this room, you know, we have different, different heights, different way, right? And this is a quantitative treat, basically, you know, okay? so not like a disease, you know, yes or no, I mean, that's a qualitative, this is quantitative, okay, you have, a little bit shorter and, and you have much uh, taller, okay. The same thing for gene expression. I mean, gene expression can be different, you know, from person to person. I mean, 
uh, and this is a quantitative trees. So what is the genetic factor basically affecting those genes? So we use the liver basically study you know, FATS1, FATS2, FATS3, because they cluster together. I mean, you see the polymorphism across over the, the same cluster as well. So which gene actually involved into those um, polymorphisms? We're trying to uh, make uh, some connection between the, the genotype and some phenotype, okay? So that we quantify the FATS1, FATS2, FATS3, uh, you know, within those um, livers. Uh, we map the, all the signals to each dot is uh, stand for one polymorphism, okay? You see the 42 SNPs actually highly correlated with um, fatty acid receptor one expression in the liver, okay? So meaning that, um, you know, some of, you see this figure, basically the minor allele carrier, okay, the TT carrier, you know, give a much lower um, uh, gene expression in the liver, okay? And same thing for the protein level, if you look at the TT, and they have a much lower uh, protein expression compared to um, the um, the common audio um, carrier, like this one. Okay. Um, so this study basically showing that FATS1, not FATS2 or FATS3, is involved in this story because they are the ones um, that are not connected with um, those SNP, but only the FATS1 is connected with those alleles. Okay. <coughs> And, and then we did a lipid, lipid DOM analysis, you know, see how those um, polymorphisms and the minor alleles are going to affect, you know, the, um, the phospholipid comp uh, component in the liver. And those are phospholipid that we quantify. Uh, of course, some of them are saturated, some of them non-saturated. Uh, we started actually in a genome-wide, you know, we put all the SNPs from the, the genome. Uh, <laughs> And turn out to be those polymorphisms in these locus um, are the highest um, or the strongest association with the uh, saturated um, phospholipid. Okay, so the minor allele carrier they have more saturated um, um, uh, phospholipid in their liver. Okay, um, you see many the p value is much uh, lower, very very low. And this is a wonderful <coughs> phospholipid that being associated with you know the the minor allele carrier, they have much higher level than the common allele carrier. Okay. Well, and if you look at the total fat, okay, whatever you know, the, how much total fat, which is mainly triglyceride uh, level. Okay. Uh, again, I show you the inverse correlation with the gene expression already, and this is a, one of the study we just published on hepatology this year, early time. Uh, there is a week with several um, SNPs within this. This is like a representative SNP of one hundred forty-two, but they are consistently correlated with uh, the total fat, and also correlated with Nash. Okay, we have you know quantified the Nash um, whether this is an um, inflammatory liver or not. Okay, you see there is a small cohort of only fifteen, uh, but the allele frequency of the minor allele frequency is of over fifty percent. Okay, compared to here, it's only about a third. Okay, and this is a significant difference, okay, the cluster in the NASH patient, okay? Um, so for, um, you know, brief summary, basically you see, you know, from the DNA, that is, you know, the, the genotype, okay, and change the RNA expression, okay, change the mRNA expression of FATS1, and also the protein uh, expression, and lead to a, a saturated lipid um, accumulation. Okay, and that basically promotes the total fat accumulation and fatty liver disease. So this is a, our liver, uh, human liver basis study. Well, this is, you can see, this is a more likely a correlative study, okay? Um, and this is association, doesn't mean this is a cause or effect, okay? It's like, you know, I have a black hair, I use chopstick, you know, as a Chinese, you know, but in this population, you're gonna always see these two things connected, right? So people you people have black hair, more likely to use chopstick. Okay, but doesn't mean this is a cause, right? This is, doesn't mean that you have black hair because you have black hair, then you use plastic or vice versa. So this is like a correlative study cannot tell you the cause, right? So then we have to basically see whether this is a cause or effect, you know, whether FATS1 is exactly you know, the gene that involved. And then we manipulate this gene expression by knockdown, okay, uh, or over suppress. We focus on two, um, cell lines. One is a hyper G2, 
and the other one is uh, uh, HER7. Those are two popular cellulites in the uh, liver uh, derived from hepatocyte, basically. Okay. So, and the, the unique character is, you know, HEPA G2 is a major allele homozygote, while the HER7 is a minor allele homozygote, okay, uh, if you genotype. And then um, also, if you measure, you know, by Western blood, you can see that the HEPA G2 has a, a little bit higher fat S1 protein level compared to the HU7, and lockdown with the sRNA that dramatically, you know, decreased the, the protein level, okay? Um, we also challenged the cells with the palmitic acid, ulic acid, which are, you know, mainly uh, very uh, common, the most common saturated and, and the uh, mono um, saturated fat as, uh, acid in, in human and uh, in animal, okay? We challenge the cell with that, you know, just mimic like a high fat intake, okay? And you see knockdown of fat S1 basically lead to a higher accumulation of um, uh, triglyceride in those cells, okay? This was stained by all red O. Uh, we construct a, a you know a stable cell line using H, shRNA, virus-based shRNA, and then, then select um, the stable cell line. Again, I mean we show that knockdown the fat S1 basically lead to a higher accumulation of those um, um, triglycerides. Uh, in Hue Seven, though, we also make a stable cell line by overexpress because it's a, it has lower endogenous level of fat S1, right? So we always suppress that in same so like once you over express you get some protective effect compared to the control. Okay, so this is like positive part and negative part, and this is all consistent. Okay. So HAPG2 and HIO7 are two basically liver cancer cell lines. I mean, a lot of people are gonna um, criticize, you know, why use you know some of the cancer cell lines, which may not be exactly mimic like a human. Um, hepatocyte, primary hepatocyte. Okay, then we just buy a, uh, a primary hepatocyte. Those are liver cells that are isolated from a piece of liver tissue from real human tissue. Okay, uh, those cells though they can only survive about four to five days. But our effect is pretty dramatic in a short short time. So we knock down that using the uh, virus based uh, shRNA again. I mean, you see the accumulation, the 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 black. Basically, it should be like a red, okay, but I, we take like a black-white um, picture right here. So more dark, basically more accumulation of um, triglyceride. And you see there's knockdown cells has much more dramatic accumulation of the fat um, in the hepatocyte as well, okay? So what about, uh, so this is just isolated, you know, cells. Then what What if you put into the system, okay, whether whether the system gonna develop a particular phenotype similar to uh, fatty liver disease. That's why we collaborated with Dr. Uh, Chapkin and Dr. Fan. Uh, you know, they have like a system knockout mice of this gene, okay, particularly knockout. Uh, but reading the papers that, that they published uh, several years ago, you know, in five to six weeks, you know, from the liver tissue, we didn't see much of a fat accumulation, but this is, under a regular um, true diet, okay, uh, without give any uh, challenge. Uh, but Dr. Fan's um, group also uh, collecting um, the liver tissue from 12 weeks of regular diet feeding, okay, because I guess, you know, their interest is not in the liver. I mean, they pay much attention to something else, you know, but we are interested in the liver right here. Uh, then, then, then we see, you know, the RNA-seq data, you know, this is like a high throughput sequencing in the whole transcriptome and, and see what happened, you know, um, in the, uh, in the knockout of mice versus the Y type, okay? Uh, and you see this, those are the, 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 the key enzymes and, and marker genes involved in lipid, uh, hepatic lipid uh, metabolism or uh, homostasis, okay? You see lip lipogenesis, okay, those genes are generating more uh, fatty acid. Uh, they are not much a change, basically, okay? But if you look at a fatty acid or triglyceride uptaking, I mean, those are like fatty acid being taken into the cells, and this dramatically increase, meaning that the, 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 the hepatocyte are basically taking a lot of uh, those fatty acid from the blood into the, uh, the, uh, the liver. Triglyceride can be secreted from the liver to the um, the blood, and this is decreased actually. 
a fatty acid oxidation, this is like a burning out of the fatty acid, okay? And then you can imagine that the more burning, the, the less uh, fat. But here, you see that's a quite interesting. They are basically increased, okay? The oxidation step get increased, which is actually also observed in the um, human sample, you know, because it's, it's still controversial, uh, you know, whether oxidation is getting higher or lower. It could be kind of an adaption step, okay, people getting much loading of the total fat then that trigger you know the um, oxidation but that's not enough to compensate you know the loading uh, of the total fat but more interestingly I mean this oxidation um, we also see some of the markers involving oxidative stress you know, that also get dramatic increase meaning that the you know the uh, the oxidation basically leak out a lot of um, um, you know, those um, bad things, you know, of the of oxidative um, uh, component into the, the cells. Basically, you could imagine that those leak out of this um, uh, oxidative component that may lead to some damage and, and um, uh, lead to some inflammation as well. I mean, this is a quite common in, in fatty liver disease as well. And more likely, if you look at inflammation, fibrogenesis, um, and those uh, marker genes get dramatic increase. That's, that's without any um, surprise, bec because you knock down this gene, and then the EPA DHA level get much lower. And, and then you could imagine you know, the inflammation imbalance being break, uh, broken, okay? And then the anti-inflammation anti um, effect was lost. And some other genes, you know, including FTF21. This is this is a very interesting guy. I mean, this is like a, it's called fibroblast growth factor um, 21. I mean, there are many many fibroblast growth factor, but this one is a particular work in the liver. And recently, just you know, a lot of publication just showing up this small protein and, and ligand that have you know very much function more more likely a beneficial function you know, to human health. Okay. Um, so especially in fatty liver, diabetes, okay. Um, Ila Lili has um, recently made, you know, analog for this um, FGF21. I mean, they inject this into um, human blood and you can see everything get lower, okay. Glucose, lipids, you know, fatty liver, um, liver function, you know, those uh, enzyme, uh, all those markers getting lower. So that's so indicating that this is very important thing. But here we also see you know, knock down the fat as one, you get lower of this. So meaning that the protective effect of this molecule getting lower in the mouse as well. Okay. Well, I would like to show this, you know, uh, Dr. Chapkin and uh, Dr. Fan didn't see this yet. Um, and this is some of our very preliminary study, you know, uh, we're trying to challenge the, uh, the mouse model using the high fat diet. Okay, just trying to mimic, you know, what happened to what we take, you know, the Western diet. Okay, as I said, every disease is like the interaction between genotype and environmental, especially diet. Okay, so we challenged the mouse with a high fat diet in four, for four weeks, feeding uh, eight weeks and 12 weeks, and then we kill the mice to look at, you know, the, li the liver histology. Okay, and this is using red oil to stain, you know, the, the total fat accumulation in the uh, the, the liver. You see the knockout knock mice has much uh, dramatic um, accumulation of fat. This is just a four week of um, feeding, which is quite short, uh, but you all already see you know, a lot of fat accumulation compared to um, the Y type. Okay, unfortunately, we only have two. I think we're expecting one more, you know, probably, and we can do some statistics from the uh, two more. Okay, good, great. <laughs> Um, which is, you know, very encouraging to me. Of course, we haven't, you know, married about the inflammation, probably not yet, about four weeks, but eight weeks or 12 weeks, we expect to see, you know, more severe stuff. So then coming to the question, okay, you knock down, meaning similar to the situation that in human population, you have a minor allele carrier, okay? Remember the minor allele carrier, about 30% of people within this room, you know, you're gonna have a lower fat S1 activity in your body, okay? So then whether those people, you know, we treat with DHA, we supplement EPA or DHA or fish oil to those people, which will be beneficial to you guys, okay? Uh, and this is the hepatitis 2 cell. Uh, uh, you see that we knock down the hepatitis 2 cell compared to the control. We supplement the DHA using different um, concentration. It does show that 
the, the cell lines that knock down the FedS1 has a better response, you know, uh, response to the DIG treatment. Okay, so you see this is a dramatic uh, difference with the control um, cells under the highest concentration. Same same thing in the hepatocyte. You know, uh, we we supplement the uh, the DHA uh, with the palmitic acid or oleic acid. You see, you know, from here to here, this is a dramatic drop but compared to the control. Okay, and this is a very huge difference. Um, and meaning that you have fat S1, and then you have some fatty liver, and those fatty liver actually more respond to facial oil treatment. Okay. So, so for conclusion, um, basically. We found out that fat S1 variant, those are naturally existing um, variants among human population. Okay, those may significantly reduce, uh, I'm sorry, um, reduce the fat S1 desaturated activity and then lead to a decreased uh, hepatic proof uh, desaturation flux. Okay, desaturation activity being lower within the, the, the liver. Uh, which increases the susceptibility to fat liver disease. Okay, this is one, one thing. And then fat S1 lower function alleles lead to increased sensitivity to um, omega 3 proof uh, treatment. And then you can imagine that the uh, nephro DNS patient, that, that because of those um, fat S1 deficiency, they might be more sensitive to, to the omega 3 proof uh, treatment. Okay, so here comes you know, a theory, you know, whether we need to take um, fish oil or, or just eat a fish based on our genotype, okay? Um, what do we call personalized fish eating or, or you know, fish oil <laughs> intake, okay? So the theory is basically you see that, you know, the fatty acid, um, you know, the, the fatty liver that could be caused by many, many genetic factors and also environmental factors, but that's specifically related to those variants, those people, you can imagine they have you know pretty dramatic um, deficiency about uh, EP and DHA, and those people are maybe more likely to respond uh, a fish oil treatment. While the others that may be caused by other things, they they might be not very sensitive to that. Okay, uh, I could see that there are many uh, several actually uh, clinical trials already being done uh, in this area using fish oil to treat fatty liver disease. Um, some studies show, you know, uh, uh, a good result. Some some studies show a bad result. I mean, the result is quite a mixing. But unfortunately, none of these consider this genetic factor. Okay, and you can imagine, like any pills that you take, any like um, medicine that you take, you know, always, always, you know, there are some interpatient difference. Some people are going to respond. Some people are not. So, what is the the reason? I mean, genetic factor especially this is natural existing in the human population would be one of the reasons, right? So this is what we talk about with several physicians in Indiana. Hopefully we're gonna have some clinical study. We're right now, you know, submitting some grant to getting some money uh, to do this. Uh, but um, some studies that recent, recently shown that, you know, um, some indication that, you know, people carry on the minor it would be happen a better accumulation of uh, um, uh, omega-3 fatty acid, you know, um, intake um, and in, in their body, in their um, red blood cells, or in their tissue samples. So those are some some study that, that I summarized, which is kind of indicating uh, our theory might be true, okay? So as a proof of concept, come with the latest news, okay? This is published on Science, um, you know, by Dr. Nielsen's group in Berkeley. Um, is a fish oil good for you or not? I mean, it depends on your DNA, okay? This is a very um, uh, fantastic um, you know, paper. I suggest everybody to read that paper, uh, especially when nutrition people, okay? Um, so basically, those these um, scientists basically um, study the Inuit people in Greenland, okay? We know the Eskimo people, they, they you know, take a lot of meat, okay? But at the same time, they take a lot of fish as well. And then you can imagine they have a lot of fish oil um, intake. I mean, but, but, but at the same time, you take a lot of meat. They don't have a lot of vegetable um, in the very north uh, part of I mean. uh, 
But the study basically identify a mutation in those in those people. Okay, uh, ninety nine percent of those people carry on that mutation, compared to only about four percent among Caucasian and fifteen percent in Asian. Okay, and though. And though this mutation basically happened to the fat S1 locus, okay, making a lower expression and function of the fat S1 activity, okay. So this is a parallel to our theory, but you could see, though any of the people actually protective of cardiovascular disease, okay, a lot of other metabolic diseases they, they take a lot of meat, I mean, which seems like a pretty fat, um, but at the same time they get you know protected. Why? So it seems like the lower, so parallel our theory, the lower fat S1 activity, and they don't need that, okay? Because they compensate, you know, the, the activity using um, the fish oil they take, like the EPA and DHA. So then the whole population, you see, they are kind of adapted to that kind of a diet. Okay, this is a kind of a proof of concept to our theory, so hopefully we can see the similar things in our, um, Group in general. All right, so the future direction is involving that we try to understand what is um, the mechanism. So, so why lower PUFA, why lower EPA and DHA? Because knockdown of fat S1 will lead to uh, kind of uh, triglyceride accumulation. I mean, that there are certainly a lot, a lot of things, uh, a lot of molecules involved and in pathways. So we have to tease out of that, and and also, um, you know. We are gonna making um, some tests about this fat S1 allele um, in the mouse model. See to prove more uh, likely, you know, whether this would be uh, respond better to proof of treatment. Okay. And recently, we also talk about get this into a pediatric area because you know fish oil is a quite a safe uh, dietary factor. You know, you don't have to worry about toxicity because so far we didn't see any um, drawback. I probably for kids, you know. For children, you know, the PO is too big, you know, some, sometimes it may make some trouble, but we can make different more, uh, formulation, you know, put in the milk, put in the, um, you know, formulation stuff. Um, so why we take that, that we also have some, you know, preliminary data with that, you know, this is showing some pediatric livers, you know, you see the MR level of fat S1 is significantly associated with stetosis, which, which is a total fat accumulation. And the higher uh, the, uh, the uh, fat S1 expression, the lower uh, stetosis, you know, which is uh, total fat. And also this is like a serious red staining of a collagen. The collagen is the protein making fibrosis, okay? And you see there's also a, a inverse correlation. So the higher the fat S1, the lower uh, <coughs> potential uh, fibrosis. And this is a NASH. Uh, we only have four NASH patients, but, but they keep um, showing, you know, they have a lower fat S1. Uh, activity as well in their body, uh, and, and we also quantify the the gene markers and, and see whether they clustered in the traditional um, uh, pathways. And you see those genes are regulated among those livers, although not a big uh, sample size. But we did see you know significant reach of those um, genes involving hepatic fibrosis, AR char acti uh, activation, liver damage. I mean those are very known, very well known. Uh, pathways involving um, um, the NFOD. And PPAR alpha, as, as we see, this is a very important transfer factor. And those genes regulated by PPAR alpha are getting significantly downregulated. Uh, RAR, uh, VDR, mitochondrial membrane potential, I mean, those are uh, also known genes that are well established in uh, conflict colic fatty liver disease, and they get downregulated. Significant. So this is also kind of like the corroborate our hypothesis that you know this uh, gene uh, also involved pediatric um, fatty liver disease. But pediatric fatty liver disease is also about fifteen percent. I mean, this is also a pretty um, stunning, especially in the obesity uh, kids. You know, that could be reached to thirty-eight um, percent uh, in the later stage, like adolescent. You know, young young uh, adults. You know, the they have much more chance you know, to have a cirrhosis you know, in their liver, and this is a, this is a very high impact area as well. Okay. All right. So this is pretty much what I uh, what we have done so far. You know, I would like to take the opportunity to thank um, the people in my lab. Shamani is the PhD student, and Ron is a postdoc work on this project. 
uh, Dr. Ming Zhang is from statistic um, department and doing a lot of um, genomic analysis with us. Uh, Indiana University, Naga Chanasani is a hepatologist, a very well known hepatologist. So we are thinking about some of the uh, clinical study. Uh, Guangdong did some analysis about the uh, EQTL mapping. Uh, Jingmei is uh, a pathologist, actually. Uh, of course, Dr. Chapkin, Dr. Fang, you know, did a lot of my study right here. And uh, I think, you know, the people provide money um, to us, you know, to do this um, study. Um, and that's all. I, you know, I'd be happy to take some questions. Open the floor up to any questions. Uh, with some of the work you showed in the cell lines, when you, you added DHA and you saw less of a phenotype, right. um, did you ever try EPA? I'm just curious the difference. Yes, we, we tried the EPA. EPA had you know similar effect over there. I, I just hit into it. Yeah. Very interesting study. So, particularly, so you, you showed that to the different population and that association. And then the, my question is actually different from that. So, particularly, environmental factor, for example, the, the listed in models, the NOFA diverse and hyperdiverse model, if that kind of a course, do you see the uh, down regulation or up regulation, whatever change in the fed one gene expression? Among the, the among different population? No, I mean, in the model. So, you, let's see, because you showed the, the uh, your view that's a different story, it's genetic right. factors, not sure. the crisis, environmental factors. Sure. Let's say in response to hazard and failure, right. so to create a, a better model during this uh, transition, uh, in what response to that refactors the genes that you studied the phase one. Right. Is it down regulated or do you see any clear look at the negativity or? Um, that's a good question. I think we haven't seen like. I guess you're going to be more or less if in the cell line you're going to see uh, you're going to see a genetic plus a um, medium uh, interaction, I guess, right? So because you know if you have a higher if if you have a genotype that express higher fat as one, then you can imagine that when you feed the uh, when you treat the cells with with um, a high fat media, for example. It may lead to higher expression, I guess. Um, I have no idea. I, we, did, we didn't test that yet. But, but we could keep in mind and take a look at it all. Thanks. OK. So having a lower fat one means that there's simply what, less total polyunsaturates available because it is using both families of uh, right. fatty acids to desaturate. Right. Um, well, we did see that, you know, it, of course, we didn't quantify the phospholipid based on the, uh, um, the fatty acid component of N6 or, or N3. It, it just, you know, this phospholipid lipidomic analysis just, you know, in general, gave us some indication like how many double bond that we can, we can take a look. Uh, it basically showing up, you know, the, the saturated versus non-saturated ratio, okay, the pairwise ratio between those lipids getting higher within the minor allele. We didn't see much of the, oh, of course, you know, there are several lipids that we did see very high correlation with the, uh, the knockdown, uh, meaning that the single lipid, without thinking about the ratio, okay, their amount is also correlated with the minor allele. We, we don't know yet whether this is in six or in, in three, though, because, you know, those are, like a more general uh, mass factor based you know, quantification, there's is this is not like a cosinoid um, quantification more specifically. So, so if you're African American, you have a more active FADS one. Yes, and therefore you think that explains in part their protection. Some of the protective effect. Yes. Yeah, as I, opposed to Hispanics, which have a lower FADS one. Right. right. And they show a higher risk. That's right. Okay. This is a quite a consistent, but of course, you know, there are many factors um, showing there as well. I mean, uh, I mean, you see, this is like the Inuit people. Um, this is a go back to a long history of our human evolution I mean, from out of Africa and, and walk to everywhere, and they take in different diets. And they kind of adapt to that kind of a diet. I think you need the people just one of the extreme. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So any of have low uh, low expression fat is That's right. probably because they don't need to generate long chain fatty acids. They're ingesting them in sacks. Right. As opposed to right. Texans who love short, shorter chain saturated fat. <laughs> Are we taking any part? What's for lunch? <laughs> uh, oh, any any other questions? Oh, yes, one more. Sure. When you say high fat diet, what percentage of calories are you talking about? I think we talk about over fifty percent, right? Like sixty percent. Sixty percent. Yeah. So in Inuit people, I think this is over fifty percent of the, you know, their their calories come contribute to fat. That's, that's quite high. Seal and fish, polar bear, probably. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's give Dr. Wu a big hand. Right, thanks a lot. Our students are invited to have lunch with him. Oh, wonderful! Uh, immediately following the seminar, back in Peter Matil. <laughs> if you haven't signed the uh, mortgage statement, here's the link. Uh, please do so.